Everybody ready? All right, camera speeding and action. Matt. How you doing, man? Matt Hewer. <laughs> How, How are you, man? I'm doing great, Rob. Thanks for having me on here. Of course, my pleasure to have you here. <laughs> You are you. You're really tall. You're a really tall guy. Tall guy. Yes. yes. That is like, is it annoying or is it is it great? I mean, I it used to be great when I when I played sports and stuff more, and I could use it for a purpose. But now that I don't really have that that tall person purpose, like it's kind of interesting. Yeah, like unneeded attention. <laughs> tall, hashtag then, tall person purpose. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, like I just, I just had a really bad flight because like I was in a seat where my knees were touching the seat in front of me the whole time. I was just begging, begging and praying that <gasps> the person in front of me didn't recline because yeah, yeah. I would have squealed because I, I can't, you can't bend this part of your, right. You know, I don't know what this bone's bones are called. Yeah. Notoriously, your, yeah, the your thighs <laughs> are not, they're not composable. So like, yeah, I mean, there's just like certain things like, I hit my head on a lot of stuff. Like I have an older house. Um, it was built in like the twenties, so, so it's oh. like like our basement. There's like there's like part there's like just odd shapes and things in different <laughs> places. I, I hit my head a lot on stuff. Like, but then there's there, you know there's good things. I have three kids and you know they're all tall and it's just, I don't know, it's kind of fun to see them, you know, being on the taller side of the spectrum and um, you know people people comment on their height a lot more. And, yeah you know stuff like that so that, that's kind of cool do you, do your kids play sports oh yeah oh yeah all three of them do you know great what do they, do they play basketball they play basketball baseball softball my my, my daughters play softball uh, my youngest plays t-ball she's, she's five um they do swimming tennis they do cross country they're, they're very 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 active my wife is a, was a college athlete and um yeah she keeps them she keeps them moving that's great man i love that are they are they are your kids aces fans they are yeah absolutely i mean i I've, i mean i've been started started with the aces seven years ago and you know they know where i'm going when, when i travel yeah you know i travel a lot for work you know and, and they're always asking me where i'm going what i'm working on and you know at this point they're just conditioned to know that when WNBA season is because they're, they're all WNBA fans they're, they're WNBA fans more more than they are i guess just aces fans right like we, we have kind of a uh a house divided i guess because uh, <laughs> really yeah like seattle storm we we obviously i live in seattle that's where i'm, where I'm from and uh, i started with the seattle storm my company still produces seattle storm games i'm still very close with them you know and some of their players and um and and organization folks their owners i know all, you know all those people and they helped me kind of get my start in this business so I, i'll always have a certain you know deep-rooted love for that group and of course um yeah, so the, we go to Storm games because I can't fly them out here to Aces games all the time. They've been to a few Aces games. They came out here for All Star when last time I was here uh, in Las Vegas. So they've come out and they're getting to the age where it's easier to travel with them. So it's actually really fun to get them to come come out to these type of things. But you know, they got, they've gotten to meet the players. My son went viral after meeting Asia Wilson, no <laughs> like because he was yeah he was so excited. He, <laughs> he you know I I'd been working. I think at the time it was about two two seasons ago. So I'd been working for him for five years or or whatever and. Again, they're just very conscious of everything. They watch the road games. They like seeing me on TV. He loved Asia Wilson. He's always loved Asia Wilson. And um, he had never got to see Asia Wilson play. Of all the Storm games we went to, they just never coincided with an Aces game or whatever. Mm. And he had never been to Vegas at the time. And so, uh, you know, before the game, he, you know, he has a card collection. They, they collect WNBA cards and stuff. And he had gotten his WM, you know, his, his Asia Wilson card ready. And I, oh, I, he so was cool. going to the Aces game. And obviously, I, I know the players because of all the interactions I've had with them right. over the, of course. over time. And I could have easily just probably made that interaction happen myself. But I really wanted him to work for it, you know, like any other kid. And, ah, this is, is that's good. That's, that's so, good parenting. That's good. But that's I didn't, good, I didn't think he would parenting. do what he did, I guess. And so what happened was I take him to this game. And, you know, my daughter, my older daughter, was really excited to meet her, too. She's just a little more timid, a little more shy, a little more reserved. Calvin is he's just out there. He's a wild, he's a wild, loud child. And, um, you know, Asia, it was in Seattle. Asia's, um, there, obviously I'm sitting near him, but I, Calvin's kind of following Asia. Well, she comes out and does the same routine every game. You know, you've probably seen it. Yes, of course. Like, same routine every game. She does on the road as well. Calvin comes out and, you know, he's, as she comes out, every time she's moving to one side of the court, he's moving to that side of the court and he's following <laughs> her. And he's, you know, he had this little voice at the time. He still kind of does, but yeah, you know, two years ago, his voice was like Asia Wilson, Asia Wilson. <laughs> so he's, you know, he's screaming Asia Wilson, Asia Wilson, trying to get her uh, attention. 
And, you know, she's out there for a good 10 minute period or whatever. And he's just going back and forth. Politely and, using her full name. Yeah, yeah. Like, Asia Wilson, Asia Wilson, will you, will you sign my autograph? And he's holding his card up. He's got his pen. He just, every time she goes to the right side of the court, he goes to the right side of the court. He's just following her everywhere. And I, like, you know, a few minutes in, she finally turns to him. It's like, she's like, I got you. I got yeah, you. Like, yeah. give me, let me finish. And I yeah. got you. And so at that point, he had kind of gotten the attention of like the media and like the AP photographers and all these other photographers had kind of picked up on what was happening over wow. there. And then so she finishes a workout and comes and signs his card. And the, like, he made this like crazy face. Like, he was just like looking at the card, like, you know. <laughs> and then so like, I, 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 I tweeted the picture out and was just like kind of told the story as much as you can in the right. kind of Twitter characters. And, um, you know, she tweeted it and was like, you know, retweeted it and was like, glad we can make this happen. And, um, you know, all the ESPN was hitting me up being like, can we use this? And all the, you know, big, once that starts happening, you know, it's going to go, go, yeah, go, go yeah, kind of viral. So wow. it was on all the major platforms, you know, especially the the women's sports platforms. And, you know, I just let it fly because it, it was like a perfect, a perfect example of like, when I don't want to pat myself on the back too much for parenting, but like one thing I'm very prideful in is how my kids view, you know, women's sports and, and, um, my, my son has grown up thinking that the Storm, the Aces, WNBA is equally as cool as the NBA. And, you know, he, he doesn't look at it any different. So, you know, whether it's women's athletics, you know, sports are sports. And that's how we've kind of raised our kids. And, you know, I want to make sure that my daughters have the same, you know, opportunities and, and are encouraged the same way my son is. And it's a very, uh, I guess, equal household in that way. So I love that, man. Sports are sports. I love yeah. that. And my honestly, my wife's a better athlete than me, so she kind of drives a lot of that anyway. <laughs> anyway, she's she's a runner, so she just humbles me very much. And, she is she like a marathon runner or uh she doesn't do marathons or she's done a marathon. She like casually just did one one time. But like she she's a she ran in Notre Dame. She's a cross country runner. Oh, okay. Um she uh she runs every morning. I I jokingly call her like a terminator because you know in Seattle <laughs> the weather's not great every day. Uh, but regardless of what the weather is, she's out there at like, you know, five thirty Rain or shine. six AM, yeah, prior wow. prior to the work day get, wow. getting it in. So good for her. Yeah, huge kudos to her because she usually comes back from the workout and I'm I'm just getting in woke, bed. I'm, get, I'm getting woken <laughs> getting up by the kids. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. yeah. Eating breakfast or whatever, you know, hanging out. I'm usually getting bossed around at that point, but yeah. So, Matt, so what is your sign? My so like my Zodiac sign. Zodiac sign. sign. Um Aquarius. You're an Aquarius. Yeah. You know, every Aquarius I know uh, is they're either very reckless or they become very obsessed with things. I'd say both of those have been true in my life. And, uh, <laughs> but also like super well-liked people, Aquarius in general, super well-liked. And this is the, this is the main thing though. And the weird thing I think about Aquarius, you, do you, do you get mad? Ever? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Really? You be the I'm, first I'm, I'm like right I've on the known. fringe. I'm like right on the fringe, though. I'm like I'm a fringe? late Aquarius. I'm you're like, late. I'm like, I'm like, one, of, I'm like one of the last days that you could be an Aquarius. I think. So I, yeah, I know. I definitely get angry. I don't. I don't hold on to it very, very long. I guess. Yeah. Like I can get angry in a moment, though, for sure. But like, I'm, I'm usually quick to realize that, like, I probably overreacted, or, um, you know, life goes on. I'm old enough to know that now. Like, I, I don't hold on to things too much. Like anger i guess i can get angry like in my job in the nature of my job there's going to be times where you're going to be frustrated you know directors you, you, producers you have to make so many in the moment decisions all the time yeah and you know the stuff that i guess frustrates me is the stuff that is preventable so stuff that we can like that we should should have a procedure to check or you know we had an error in the last game where we didn't have the right track performance track for high world it's the first time that's ever happened in my entire career doing this with the aces but it's like it's because we just didn't have you know an extra procedure in place to make sure that the right track wasn't in place and they didn't rehearse that day yeah so it, it can happen if those two things happen and those factors happen so we just have to always you know put a new procedure or a plan in place to make sure that those things don't ever happen or the probability of it happening is so small that it you know, it's next to not happening. And that is the nature of production. Is is uh, somehow I end up. I've, I mean, for some reason, of course, you know, we're all in the same industries, uh, and uh, I, I end up talking about this a lot, man. It's like it, there's you get one shot. Oh yeah. Oh so, yeah. yeah. I heard you guys talking. Yeah. About there's this. no. There's no staff meeting. There's no nothing. It's like you know, if and if it's and if it's going wrong, it needs to be fixed right then. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, there's, there's, just, you, can, you can plan so much for an event. You know, we, we, we put together these really detailed documents from a show, scripts, um, but there, there, you always know there's going to be 
every game is different for a reason. You know? Yeah. You know, every game, every, that's part of the thrill of it too. And part of the really fun human side of directing is that every game is different. There's going to be situational moments where you get to act on things. And, um, you know, luckily and fortunately, the aces have invested so much in, in our creativity and trust us so much with our creativity and invested so much in content and allowing us to create content that I've never been in a producer's seat where I felt more armed for games. Like I've, I jokingly say, because of how much situational stuff we, we've created, again, I've been doing this in this league particular, this is my 23rd season in the WNBA. So I really know, I really know how to program a game. I know every situation or almost every situation that could possibly happen. Some, some situations that we plan for and have content for may only happen six times all season. It may happen four times all season, but we have that piece of content ready to play and trigger. And I think that's, um, you know, that's the level of thinking that we bring into this stuff. And again, the aces appreciate all of that and they want us thinking that way. And so again, when I'm producing these aces games, I always kind of joke, I was just, I was joking with their front office, Matt Delson. I told this to Mark Davis too, but I was like, I feel like Iron Man, you know, when all that the, like the yeah, weapon, yeah. weaponry comes out of his back and really expands, and you see like, oh, he's not just the you know, he's not just the humanoid metal thing. He's got all these weapons that are hidden yeah. hidden in this machinery. When I, when we have a lot of our content in the bag, and you know, we're seven games into the season, eight games now into the season. You know, by the time we're hitting late season playoffs you know we have almost everything that we filmed at media day has been turned into content usable content and you know we we really squeeze out that media day we've, we've really gotten good about being efficient everything we film we use we have, we have great intent to use it um so by the time the end of the season comes around we i have this massive amount of content that i can drop in all these different situations and i just like, like again feel like iron man i can just attack 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 and like with like frivolously too like i can hype on the back end of First quarter timeouts, second quarter timeouts, and I and I have levels to all the different hypes because some of them are, are filmed for first quarter and filmed for second quarter intent, and some of them are filmed for you know late in the games, and um, so it's fun to be able to kind of you know play that human side of side of the director role. That I mean, it, it is evident the amount of work that goes into the show, and I I th that's the honestly the show is what made me an Aces fan. This is well before I started shooting for them. Yeah. Um. And that is the thing that I always tell people. It's it's the it's it's like it's the best show I've been to in sports. Period. We, we've gotten a lot of compliments, and honestly, I I got to give a lot of kudos to like Matt Delson, um, the the he he's uh, the chief officer, operating officer, I think is is his title, and but he, he he's really the one who um, kind of renewed our contract when Mark bought bought the team, and then really tapped into our creative, saw that we were capable of doing. Um, really creative things he had seen some examples in seattle of stuff we were doing he, he had seen some of our other work and he was like um you know all the most extreme things that you guys are trying we want you to kind of make those like a standard and at the time like he he took everything that we were doing with special effects and all of that all of that in addition and basically he said all of the your top level stuff is now our, our regular game stuff and i want you to go find more options from vendors so that we have a new tier for what an ABC game feels like. So he, they instantly invested, you know, six figure numbers into special effects. They, they went deeper into our content and really gave us creative freedom. They also kind of threw some philosophies at us that we've taken in, and really run with, uh, especially over the last couple of seasons. But like he, uh, Matt wanted us to really weave in TikTok and like trending sounds yeah. and things that you might find on TikTok into situations within the game. And so, you know, I'm constantly, and I'm I'm doing this anyway, just because we, we we constantly have creative needs at, at three point for other other clients and stuff. But I I always kind of keep my eye out for stuff that would fit for the aces year round, um, and whether that's stuff that we would do with players because we have great personalities on the aces, yeah, or it's just things that we want to try or sounds that we want to integrate into you know offense beds or um, you know prompts hypes. I'm, I'm constantly keeping my eye on on the soundtrack of of what we can integrate into that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just, I think, part of having the music background and DJing background, I'm always hypersensitive into adding new sounds and things and elements, trying new things, and uh, especially where, like, that that's encouraged and, like, the ASUS front office encourages us to try new things and um, push boundaries and 
create the most hostile environment that we possibly can. <laughs> so, so it they, is definitely that. It is definitely yeah, that. and they don't muddy it up a lot with sponsorship. Like a lot of their partnership partnership activations, you know, those are also intentful. They're they're fan engaging. So they've kind of helped, you know, helped us with like with some of these philosophies, like by taking some maybe financial hits where other teams may take smaller deals to to sell some of these timeouts and maybe compromise what you're what you're presenting to your fans in some ways. I don't want to say you do that necessarily with all sponsorship, you know, because it's not that's not true. But sometimes people will sell things that just aren't that engaging, right? Yeah. Because the client that client wants it. And the Aces have done a really good job of filtering through that and finding things that are co branded and mutually beneficial for for their brands and for them and and for the fans and the experience. And so that all has weaved into again some of the stuff that we're doing and um, it's created like a two hour, two and a half hour now that we do our pregame and stuff so early. Just a thrill ride, you know. It's just a thrill ride. I think people know that they, when they go to Aces games, they're going to scream, scream, and you know, get energy out for two hours, and that's kind of the expectation. You know, I, I got to tell you too. I at the the last game I worked, we were down, and we were clearly going to lose. It was that bit much of a deficit, which is ra- which is rare for it's the been, times that I've, I've worked for the Aces. So. Yeah, yeah. And the crowd is still there. Still hanging in, still still participating in the hypes, yeah, still yeah. making noise, still supporting the team, still celebrating three point, you know, three yeah, point yeah. baskets and and all that, man. It's yeah. like that's it's very it's very rare. No, I mean, I, I I would say from the start, the Vegas community has been has embraced this team in a, in a very special way. Like they they really truly care about it, and they they came they came somewhat educated, but they came so eager to learn and like so eager to pick up on tradition and. I, th- I think what you're seeing now, you know, seven the seventh season in, is just like such great chemistry and, and tradition. We haven't changed our PA announcer. Chet's been with us since day one. The things that he says, the the people are listening and in cadence with him. When he says two shots, they're ready to echo that. Oh yeah. When he says three shots, they're ready to echo that. They'll do one if he wanted to do one, but he, he doesn't yeah, if he it. did one, they would do one. They would 100%. do one. They're 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 just they're willing to play, and honestly, that's what you want from like from a producer standpoint. They're, they're willing to play with us. And, and and I think they've seen our experimentation over time. They've seen that we're trying things. You know, just last game, we tried um, a new element that I've honestly had in my brain for like three years. Like, so I'll just take ideas. I'll come up with these ideas and kind of stash them. I put them in my notes or whatever. And sometimes I'll segment them for different teams or whatever that I think might apply best. But I've had this one in my, my head for like three years, in my notes for like three years or so. But there's never been like a, a culture a fan base culture i thought that would really embrace it and try like try it and finally we did we tried it last game it was a thing called the uh we ended up calling it the whirlpool but it was a, it's a double wave starting two waves at once simultaneously and having the crowd you know carry two waves on we did it the first time last game it worked effort, almost effortlessly oh, it, worked, it worked and it's but it's because we've done the wave so many times yeah and they were so hyped every time we've done the wave that it's like Okay, we could do two of these. We could, I'm confident we could do two of these. Like yeah. they're so engaged. It's not like part of the crowd's not into it. Yeah, I mean, when we're trying that stuff, it almost seems like 100. percent I mean, sold yeah. out. You know, sold out Michelob Ultra Arena. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah, and it's a perfect. It's a. It's one of those great you know arenas where you get a full 360 bowl. Yeah. So I, I've always loved the wave personally, especially in tight confines like that. Um, so to, to get two of them going was pretty pretty exciting. The wave is the wave is a flex. The wave is like it, it it's, a, is. it's a flex, man. It, it, I mean, there's something just. I'm a big like, um, you know, coming to these sporting events. If you really look at it like even bigger picture, it's a it's a big it's a big communal like gathering, right? Like, yeah. So to have like communal moments like the wave, I think is important. Like everybody, whether it's not everybody, I know there's probably one out of a hundred or maybe less than that that are sitting there. You know, yeah, yeah. But they're covered by the people who are doing it. Yeah. So it's like if ninety nine point nine percent of the people are having fun, then we're riding with that. You know, we're riding with that. So speaking of Chet Buchanan, yeah, Chet goes to Starbucks every single game. Yeah, he's. Does he bring you one? He does. He, he does. He, he refuses to not. <laughs> he he's refuses a, he's a, he's a, to not. He's a uh, superstitious guy. So if he does it and we see success with something, he's not gonna. He's he's gonna do it every game, and he'll ask you. He'll tell you. He says, "Do you want one today?" And I mean, I'm a big. I'm a big like fan of caffeine and stuff, especially you know on event day. I'll I'll, I'll drink the extra coffee. Um, I get really hyped up for these games, man. I I, I really do. I I think if there's anything that I guess separates and makes me different as a producer, I'm really into it, man. I'm really into the games themselves. I don't wait for the breaks. I'm I'm fully 
programming the end game experience and that's part of kind of again the philosophies that we've installed with the aces is our our end game is very aggressive especially towards the you know opposing team when they're on offense we know the rules but we're going to absolutely play go right up to the right line. up to the line yeah um so we're we're prompting we're we're using the h- hypes and things into annoying ramp up clappers d drums things that people can um you know, charge up and get behind and repetitive. They're super annoying. I mean, I, the way I was trying to explain it to some of the, the philosophies of someone like Jennifer AZ, you know, who's a former player herself. Um, she's an employee of the aces. Um, and I was explaining it to her. I was like, imagine getting double teamed by like Jackie young, Kelsey plum. If you're like young in this league, a rookie or something yeah. like that, getting double teamed by Kelsey plum, Jackie young, while also having <laughs> that happening in the background, you know, with the, like, yeah. thousands of people clapping like that, like that ferociously. Yeah, it just, it's just, we're 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 putting the sliders up, you know, we're making it as difficult as we possibly can within the legal legal means, and um, yeah, it's all part of creating a uh, best home court advantage in the league from last year. So. Yeah, I was just, I, I was just about to say that I I read that I don't remember where I read that, but yeah, I read a, that the Aces G- have the best home home court advantage in the league. Yeah, GM survey from twenty twenty. So like the GMs all across the league, each team has. And general manager they vote on a, a whole bunch of categories players and predictions on you know where which players will win which awards trends with different teams and then they have this like other category and in the other category which i've all i've always kept tabs on this because again i've been <laughs> i've been producing this league for a very long time so yeah. even, even when i was a young uh, producer for the seattle storm we won like best home court advantage like four years in a row or something like that and I, I took great pride in that. Like I wanted that. Like of course. I, and so because we also touted it, we we would be at the home games touting that, and we had a really good team, similar to how we are at the Aces now. We had a really good team, and so you could you can produce with a certain level of confidence. You know, you you have a championship caliber team. My very first year directing and um, like actually producing games, uh, I was spoiled, man. We had we, it was the 2010 Seattle Storm team. They went undefeated at home that year. We, wow. we were undefeated at home that year. We had an amazing home, like home crowd, rowdy crowd, full arenas, and we just smashed people. Like we just smashed <laughs> people. We went undefeated in the playoffs, and that was my first like championship ring and everything. So, but those philosophies that we use in 2010 are very much things that I'm still kind of implementing to this day when I'm go to these different markets and stuff and try to install home court advantages. And we do it through the lens of their city and. You know their culture and all that it's another thing we take great pride in at three point but um i think like if you go to like an atlanta dream game you go to a seattle storm game you go to a vegas game you're gonna feel like you're in that market right yeah. you're gonna you're gonna there's it's gonna be true to the market um even though we're producing the games and coming up with creative it's it's very much catered to those markets and there's a lot of research that you know we had to do because I, I i didn't know a lot about atlanta other than like the hip-hop scene that i you know was always a fan of i didn't yeah. know a lot about atlanta when we first got that contract. So that first year was just me going there, meeting people, learning from them about things they've done, and then just installing things that I knew that were kind of fail proof. And then yeah, just some of our other philosophies. And now it's like we've really let their talent and stuff shine out there and, and do that. And with our kind of like philosophies and content and stuff in the in the back, it's just become a really good show out there also. You do you do produce in a really dynamic way. I mean, I've worked a lot of sports and live events at this point, and and it it is is usually a fairly fairly programmed affair. This happens at this time. This happens at that time. This break goes off at this time. But you know, I've seen you know the production in house production at Aces literally turn the tide of games. I so that's funny you say that. Um, I I definitely think I I do believe in that, and I I think it's important that home court producers feel like they do have that type of impact because pat pat my business partner pat walker and i have always said going back to seattle sonics days because he was like uh, the director of the seattle sonics when i was like first getting my first start at the, in sports with the sonics yeah. um but that, the philosophy was always the same was like you know a really good uh home court advantage can sway a game three to five points Three to five points, and it's it's just a call a ref doesn't want to make because of the hostile environment, or 
Again, again, it's well, true though. It's true. Well, it's true. And I know there's there's rules to protect the refs. There are there are rules in course. the books. You can only show a controversial replay two times. Really, two times. If it's a controversial replay, you play you play it twice. Because you're inciting you can't, you a can't, riot. Exa- exactly. You cannot incite. <laughs> you can't incite it, and you're not supposed to add flame. You know, to the fire. Yeah, yeah. And if there are like we had ch- chance last game, you know, slandering the refs, and it's like we got to I got to do my part to make it like a a, a safe and like right you know environment too so like we'll get into a prompt that gets them out of the chant you know there's philosophies on ways to do that type of stuff but we'll get them into a d drum so that they stop chanting against the refs yeah um and it'll you know and, and, and we know work. the ref we know it the refs works. too these refs have been around <laughs> i've seen some of these refs for 20 years man. right you, got, you have so to say i, you I have know to these say people hey to them when you see them yeah man. i shake their hands pregame like yeah. they're, they're very nice people and i mean they have a tough job at the end of the day I, I, nobody's perfect i don't i, I wouldn't want to be um you know, have that pressure. Have that many eyes on me yeah. looking at all the mistakes we make. And sometimes we do because if we do make a mistake in the production, you know, sometimes it's not seen, but, you know, sometimes they are. And, um, yeah, I know, how, I know how that stuff feels. Are you under investigation? No. <laughs> yeah, right. No. <laughs> no. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I don't know, man. I, no, I've never had to. No, I'm not under anything. <laughs> um, no, but the Aces can't seem to not be under investigation I, I i think what they do um honestly is great for the league for the game um and they may like learn the hard way i guess sometimes is a, is a good way to put it um but i think with their intent it's always the same it's always to empower the players um enrich the players lives make their make their experience better they're professional athletes they're the best basketball players on the face of the planet yeah some of these are some of the best people I've yeah. ever met and encountered on the planet that have, you know, you know, great influence over the next generation of, 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 of young women and fans and like they deserve the best, you know, and I think the aces recognize that. And I, I think they are able to um, recognize that and meet that um, opportunity like as that an opportunity. And, and they've just always invested in their team in the, in the right ways, like, especially since Mark has taken over the team, he's just up the level of investment and, um, it's just it, honestly, I can see all I can see from the ACE side is constant support. So like they 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 continually, whether it's me personally, continue to support me in ways of encouraging my business, um, giving us really high end opportunities to work in places like View Studios, you know, virtual um, studios and things like that to create just epic content pieces and, and some of my most prideful. Um, projects have come through opportunities through the aces you know so it's always been something where it's like I, i've never seen the fault in their ways i guess and i don't know the business side of of how they deal with all of those type of things but um you know i, I think uh, at the end of the day the, the truth is always told and uh, what we found out and if there's if there's something that they did wrong they'll learn from it and do it right the next the next time you know i mean i i don't i don't want to bash the you know i'm not i'm not here to bash the wnba i'm a fan but like, what a way to deflate like such a cool like thing for yeah. The players, I guess you know? I, I don't. I, I, I yeah. That was, that was just like by by the time the players had ended the game, they basically found out they were under investigation. Yeah. I just don't think that's a very tactful way to do it. I think that, again, I think Sidney Colson had a really funny thread on Twitter about you know different words they could have used <laughs> you know, yeah, ra- yeah, rather yeah. than investigate. Yeah, under investigation, uh, which was really crazy. It, honestly, I read that. Yeah, it was hilarious, but it was also like very true. There's like a lot of truth to that. You know, the, the way they phrase it um, to say investigate before they have any real you know, knowledge of, of of what went down. You know, a one uh, sneakers. Are you getting in a pair early? Are you going to get a pair early? The A ones. I. I mean, I. And I, if you if, 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 if you if, are, if, can I can you get me a pair? If I'm on that list. <laughs> I would I would feel very honored. I I really doubt I'm <laughs> but I I do plan on buying them and um, me, yeah, me I too. plan on buying 100%. them probably for the family. Honestly, like my kids will get those. My 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 kids were super excited to find out that they're that she has a shoe coming and yeah. I mean, honestly, I I support. I try honestly to support as much as these players are doing, and you know they always say like you know invest in the things that you like believe in invest the things that you do with your life and stuff like that i spend a lot of my time producing WNBA games and producing WNBA content ideating WNBA content and you know, i've been trying to grow that like do my part to grow this league for 20 something years I've, I've, I've more than half my life i've been spending promoting the WNBA, 
promoting the players, trying to, you know, put the, the players in, in um, you know, platforms where they can be highlighted differently. Their personalities can be seen, different aspects of their personality can be seen, you know, different skills can be showcased and just honestly connecting with them because they are really good people, man. They're, yeah. they're very accessible people, which I think is, again, one of the beauties of the WNBA is like, if you have a favorite player or, or you're really inspired by one of the WNBA players, if you go to a game with the intent of trying to meet them, going early, you have a high likelihood of that happening. And you, you can't say that for any other league, probably. Yeah. And maybe, you know, lower lower tier AAA. But you, I see you, Jackie you, Young all the time. You, I see you, can, you can go <laughs> and find these players. So and, like, like, win, like, and, you know? and when you do, you're going to be met like with – with a great like with great hosp like hospitality like they're they're very kind they're they're usually very willing to give their time and 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 have these moments and interactions with fans and it's always been that way it's always been that way it's always something i've always said that the WNBA has done a, a great job of is like the accessibility to their players and um yeah just how much of an influence they can have uh on on young people and stuff and how that transfers just through interactions with them um a lot of a lot again a lot of that philosophy from you know early in my career we've brought to the aces too so like the the aces wanted to start opening doors open earlier right they wanted to start yeah. opening their doors open earlier um and they're like well how can we get the fans to make sure they show up well there's, there's always ways you know that you, if you give fans in, incentives to do stuff they're all that's the best way to do it so if we started um you know just a, an earlier pregame show so we have a pre pregame show that we start really early we start our camera shots really really early 75 minute mark i think it's probably one of the earliest in the league um, of the countdown clock. And, and we're highlighting the players. We're highlighting the fans. We're highlighting what the fans are wearing. If there's you know, people wearing costumes, holding signs, getting autographs. If, if players, we, we also. That's us. Uh, that's what, that's the part we do. That's yeah. the part we do. <laughs> so, that, but we also installed these like t-shirt buckets pregame that are just made. They're just there and they're completely optional. The players know that they're there, but if they see somebody holding a sign for them, or they see someone they want to go reward in the stands. There's, there's t-shirts pre pregame, like before the formal warm ups. I'm talking early, early. So if kids are there and they're dedicated and they want to have an interaction with a fan, they, I think the shirts used to even say like, "Ask me how I, who gave me this t-shirt or something like oh, that." They, they used to be that personalized. That's dope. I think it's a little more generic now, but um, still the, the access is there. I think Chelsea Gray every game goes in there and probably. Empties. I was just gonna say Chelsea Gray, she, KB, she does a great, we'll great throw job. Them. She does a Sid, great job. We'll throw them. Of, yeah. yeah, and and mm -hmm. again. If you really start to think about those as individual touch points, I mean, if, if you cut an autographed T-shirt at a game, you're going to remember that for the rest of your life as a, as a kid. You're going to remember that the rest of your life. I know if I, the interactions I've had with athletes and stuff as a child, that uh, those interactions I still remember. You know, like, like things I've you know got or autographs I gather, I still remember that stuff to this day. And like, um, I, I just think of all those small little touch points that we have throughout the co course of an entire season, or now like three seasons into doing those type of things, and. How many little of those interactions have happened and how many aces fans we've created and had like great influence over because of those philosophies those simple little philosophies of making t-shirts available to players pregame yeah i i am that person i am literally that person i started going to games in the 2021 season this is before i was affiliated with fully or any you know any uh, sports broadcast media company and it was instant fan yeah. i was like I, I i had a great time it was me and my ex-girlfriend at the time. And then we just like, you know, we're like, oh, let's go to the next game. Let's go to the next game. So it's like, it's, yeah, it. it's it's every show may be someone's first game. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. And especially this season, you know, we they, they filled the arena. They sold out the arena. I think there's maybe one game that has single game tickets. The, the tickets that are available are maybe single. Single. I'll tell you what. I I remember buying tickets for ten dollars. Right now, it's not finding the, 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 those those tickets right now. I tried to get, I tried to get tickets for yesterday's game. Yeah, the the upper bowl two hundred bucks. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's yeah, shocking. Man. Yeah, it's crazy you said that because yeah, is is I think as recent as even last year there were some games that you could get twenty or ten dollar tickets even. Yeah, and um, I remember some of the yeah again the philosophies from the upper management were like we just got to get people to see it and be exposed to it and. You know, um, the, like you said, the show kind of speaks for itself at this point. We're, yeah, it's a well-oiled machine. We have a lot of impressive, you know, tricks. We have really funny and engaging content. Like I think, again, one of the fun things about the game, because of the content that, and the style that we use, the players kind of drive a lot of the game. You know, they're gonna they're gonna be the ones introducing our fan cams. They're gonna be the ones 
prompting you throughout the game when to clap for defense. Like we we have them essentially leading you through the fan experience as as much as possible on the video board. They're going to tell you when the groups are being recognized. They're going to be the ones introducing you know all of the different elements, telling you what's next. Whether we're giving away free tacos, T-shirts, it's a flex cam. We're having the players, uh, you know, in their personalities, obviously pointed into the into the right um, directions here. But they're the ones steering you through the show. Yeah, and I think that's a really fun. Fun, fun and interactive way to do it. So I, I have to ask you this because it, it's, it's beyond irritating and I, I'm curious to hear what you think. What, why, why is, why does everybody complain about how, how, uh, what was the word I used? Why, is, why, why do people complain about how soft the NBA has become and how physical the WNBA has become? Is like, is, are people just never happy or what, like what, what, what is it? I mean, I I think one of my friends, he's actually a writer for ESPN. His name's Kevin Pelton. He, the, I've never had anybody explain it to me better and really break it down to to understand, it, like basic understanding, it any better than this. If you're if like the NBA game and the WNBA game are just, they're different games, right? Of it's, course, it's just different basketball. So like, I guess the refereeing is one conversation, but like if, his argument to always like to the unsatisfied WNBA viewer is if you're always holding the WNBA to the NBA's standard, you know, if you're always holding the WNBA style of basketball to the, to the NBA standard and you want to see these girls dunking on each other and, and playing the way the NBA style of basketball happens and uh, that, that whole style, you're always going to be disappointed. You're right. always going to be disappointed in the WNBA. Cause you're but, not watching that. But you're if you watching... take the WNBA for what it is, for what, that style of basketball is you're going to enjoy it probably even more than the nba style of basketball because it's more relatable right i i doubt i i certainly am not running up and down jumping dunking on people especially not at 42 years of age i was about to say you sure i used to i used to be able to i used to be able to do that but even then (laughs) uh, like even then it it happens from time to time in the WNBA. also you know girls can dunk like girls can dunk that's not new it's been happening for 10 15 years i mean right so You'll see him occasionally, it, it, but it, it's a totally different brand of basketball. It's a completely different brand of basketball. That it's uh, it's it's more X's and O's. It's more like the what we what the format of basketball that we we probably learned on, or, right. or, or most people learned on. So right. if you can watch the WNBA and say it's just a different brand of basketball, and just watch it and enjoy it for what that brand of basketball is, you're going to enjoy it, and you're going to enjoy it a lot. I, I, speaking to that point, I mean, it's f- for me, the, the thought is always it's athletes competing, like wh- wh- regardless of the style of the pl- of play, sure, it's athletes sure. competing. But like as a but, basketball purist, like somebody right. who I'm, I'm a basketball, like I love basketball. Yeah. Right? And like for me, I've always just enjoyed WNBA basketball because it's just really high caliber, well executed X's and O's. Right. Yeah. It's really. And yeah, they're the they're the peak physical athletes, yeah, in, in their realm. They're they're the Olympians essentially. When you watch a WNBA game, you're watching mostly Olympians run around. You know, and it, you know, it's it's what's interesting is uh, I someone mentioned this re- regarding Caitlin Clark, and I hadn't really thought about it. It's that there are less there are less teams, far less teams. So there's less slots. So yeah, you're essentially you got 144 spots in the league. Essentially, it's a league of all stars. Yeah, it's the best 144 in the league in the yeah. in the world. I mean, excuse me. Yeah, best right. 144 in the world. I mean, if you did that, if you extracted the NBA and made it the best 144 in the world, that that league would look drastically different. Tight, really yeah, tight, really tight, really tight. And that, I mean, honestly, the the the, the fringe of the WNBA is a, is a cold, dark place, man. Like the there's so many good players and young players that deserve opportunities and deserve. You know, like on the NBA side, you get drafted. They have they have now the deve- developmental league, the G League. They have places where you can get developed for two, three years right. out of college. You you're going to have your chance if you're a good good player coming out of college. You're going to have your chance to to put it to to put it to the test against the ranks of the NBA. And whether you're playing in the NBA or G League, you're going to get tested. You're you're going to have that opportunity if you're drafted in the WNBA. You might you might be a first round pick. You might be a top ten pick and not even be guaranteed a roster spot. In the That's league. wild. Yeah, that's wild. And I think this year, I think I saw a stat where it's like the highest percentage, um, you know, in 15 years or whatever um, that made teams. There's actually quite a bit of rookies this year. It hasn't been the case the last couple of years, couple of seasons. Well, luckily, the, luckily the WNBA is expanding as well. So yes. that's nice. No, it's it, yes. Thank thank gosh. Um, 
yeah, uh, from what I'm understanding, we the Valkyries have already been announced for next season. It's and pretty badass, man. The branding is pretty, it looks, pretty cool. Looks man. pretty clean. I, I do know, and it's, <laughs> again, I have I have friends in the Sacramento area, and again, WNBA history, um, you know, and NBA history, and how that kind of ties together a little bit. You know, this this team is going to be in the Bay. Valkyries are going to be in the Bay. There has been some uh, disgruntled folks from Sacramento, former Monarchs employees specifically, that I know <laughs> in my network. Yeah. That we're not very happy to see the color scheme, uh, hoping hoping obviously that they're going to get, you know, their franchise resurrected at some point. I don't think a lot of them in Sacramento have really given up that that's a possibility down the road. Um, so I think when they saw the purple color scheme and everything, they were like, "Wait, what?" You know, a team in I the mean, Bay, it's a different league. It's a, it's, it's, I mean, we, it, it, and, the, and <laughs> they and, and, and they don't have the franchise, so you right. really it's like you can't really be too mad, I guess. Um, <laughs> if, if there's not even a plan, you know, yeah. for Sacramento, but. I get, I can see why they'd be a little disgruntled. I mean, I've I've I'm I'm from Seattle. We've had the Sonics leave. I I still feel you yeah know, pains about that yeah, in a yeah. certain way about the franchise the way it is now, and we're still waiting for our team back. So I, I get it. Like uh, if, you, if you've if you've loved a team and have that team move, you know, I, I have I have empathy. Speaking of Caitlin Clark, I have to ask you because it's it is what it is it is what everybody is discussing. Um, you know, is is she hated in in the league? Is she loved in the league? Is she just another rookie and she just has is garnering a lot of media attention? And how do you feel about the impact she's made on the WNBA? Yeah, like what, what's what are your feelings surrounding? Honestly, all of that? I, I, I I I I think a lot of the new fans are struggling with just comprehending how how good this league is. Honestly, like how competitive this league is. Like it. I think a lot of people had really unrealistic expectations on her set from the get-go. Like I heard some crazy stat about like 45% of bets that were placed on the MVP of this season are on Caitlin Clark. And that's like just an insane, like the fact that people are putting money on that is just shows their kind of <laughs> lack, lack of education on how good this league yeah. is. Like, like, I, said, like I did not know that. Yeah. It was, it was one of the that. wilder stats I've heard about, about her. Uh, but it, it's 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 very telling of like the new fan, right? Like the, yeah. the especially the I would say the new the new male fan specifically. Um, I think they just come in with like they think they have this sports knowledge and they understand basketball. But again, the nuance between the basketball that they're probably used to watching and WNBA is so different. The storylines are so different. And, um, like the personalities are so different. Like the I, I would almost equate the WNBA right now to like almost like '90s NBA. And I say that for a few reasons because the physicality of the game, super physical, like WNBA is super physical, it's super physical. Yeah. And like, I've had some new fans come to me and be like, after watching a WNBA game in person, especially like up close, seeing that physicality and be like, the the NBA would never, you know, it was, it was one quote, which I <laughs> yeah. was like, it's kind of true. I mean, you see, not currently, no, no, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's, it's refereed very differently. So the physicality of the game is is kind of at its peak. Again, these these are these are athletes, man. These are Olympic athletes. These are these these players don't get tired. They like I've I've also practiced with players. I I don't do it now. I'm way too out of shape. I would never even try to keep up with with, the, with Asia Wilson. But I, in my prime, when I was in my physical prime, I was playing against Lauren Jackson in the you know championship storm team. I was playing against Lauren Jackson in practice all the time. Swin Cash, Sue Bird. I really? very I very quickly gained a very I, I would defend these girls to my death and how good they and how good they are and like yeah. sue Bar sue bird's the best point guard i've ever been on a court with male or female like swin cash might be one of the best leaders i've ever been around lauren jackson was a headache to guard like and super physical yolanda, yolanda griffith gave me a, a with one split elbow with one elbow a bloody nose and a bloody mouth at the same time these girls are strong as hell <laughs> they are not they're they're you can say what you want to say behind a keyboard or behind a tv or whatever but when when you actually get to the practice and you're on the court with them i dare most of these guys to even consider doing that first off i have a really funny story about one of my friends getting burnt by sue bird at a practice and literally screeched the skin off his knees because um you know he was trying to keep up with her and she came off a of lauren jackson screen he ended up tripping skinning his own both of his knees and slapping her arm while she jumped and hit about a free throw line jumper and she goes and one and this is mind you this is a guy who for years had told me he was going to scorch super and i finally yeah. got him this opportunity 
And he didn't even deserve the opportunity. He's not a good, like that great of a basketball player. He's maybe a high school style basketball player, which normally these girls practice against professionals, semi professionals, or college players. Like they're playing against elite basketball players even in practice. So, like for an average person to think that they have a chance against them is, is laughable at best, honestly. Like they don't get tired. That's the, that's the other thing. They're going to wear your ass out. Like they're going to wear your ass out. It, they they set screens. You're going to be. I used to chase Lauren Jackson around double screens. She if she got a half second of freedom after the double screen, she was making that shot. They're machines. Like they're well, they're training all the time. I'm guessing most of these people that are talking all this shit online and everything aren't training all the time. You know, like it, I think most like they always yeah, say. Yeah, you're like, probably right about yeah, that. Mo- most <laughs> most right ballers and most people who actually are athletes have great respect for these women. Great respect. Well, you it's, see that. You see that. I mean, the 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 top athletes in 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 male sports are at Ace Games constantly. Absolutely. Yeah. LeBron, LeBron, Damian Lillard, Am, uh, Bam Adebayo, all of them were at the game last night. Yesterday. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I feel like yeah, it's never those people that are like disrespectful. No, the WNBA. never. Typically never. not. Right? There's there is, that that is one thing that that is the that is the oddest that is the weirdest part about it. It's, inse- it's, it's, of, it's insecurity though. athletes of right of course of course it is yeah but you know like the the athletes that these that these fans or, or keyboard warriors are idolize are, support the WNBA. right 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 yeah yeah so their favorite player watches the WNBA. right yeah so odd man yeah, so yeah, but uh, it's, it's insecurity though. It that really does is. bring me to a, a, an interesting uh so i don't know if you remember this but on twitter like i don't know if this was i think this is in the off season someone some sports ca- podcaster or someone said that the, the you know that that a male high school basketball team would would, yeah, would yeah. beat the aces or or whatever. Yeah. How ridiculous is that? And how like infuriating is that? That that even and I I hate to even give air to it, but I just I want to hear your now that we just went I mean, through I, that. <laughs> I mean, to even compare it is just again kind of this silly thing of like why do we have to why do we have to compare them why do we to, have to do that to males? That's how I feel too. Like they're the I best agree. females at what they do. Why do we have to try to like categorize them with what, like a male athlete? You know what I mean? Like, right. so I hate the comparison and I, it, maybe they could, and maybe, uh, maybe a really elite, I mean, there, there's high school kids that are going to the NBA. Sure. But again, physically, some of these kids are not going to be developed and there's always going to be those freak kids. Like Amari Sotomayor came out of high school. Like I was a freaking monster. The, they're going to struggle with him the same way they would struggle with Brittany Griner in a game, you know? So like it's it's all about like physical, the physical side I guess of a male game is can be a problem for the it would be a problem maybe for some of them, but like just the height and strength and but like as far as being quick and keeping up with them, making open shots and executing plays again, these women are practicing against college players. They're practicing against semi pro players, former pro players. They're not. They're, they would be used to it. I I, I would say. Sure, a high school, a very elite high school team might be able to compete with the Aces, but but I wouldn't say they would beat them every time. You know, it's not going to be something where it's just a dominant thing. Like you're talking about Asia Wilson, you're talking about Chelsea Gray, Jackie Young. Jackie Young is not. She would be hard for anybody to guard. Yeah, just with her quickness, her craftiness with the ball. She's strong. I mean, she she, jacked. She, she would be hard. No pun for anybody to guard. Kelsey Plum, even like she's fast deep into her career now. She's physically so much different than she was as a rookie. She, like, I would say a strength of her game now is her strength itself. Like, she actually tries to bully people. Like last last game, she was literally trying to like <laughs> go through people, and she does these, you know, curl throughs now. Where, you know, maybe her rookie year that that arm slap from an opponent would have knocked that ball loose or knocked her off balance. She just goes right through those people now. I'm not sure most high school athletes are doing that. I'm just, I'm just being real. Like I know where I was in high school. I wasn't Asia Wilson's skill level in high school. H- hell no. You know, everyone, everyone seems to love working for you. Why is that? Well, I'm a, I'm a culture guy, man. I, I, and I'm a, I'm a treat people right guy. So, um, like I'm a big energy guy. I'm a, I, re- I really do try to wear my passion on my sleeve and let people know how important this stuff is to me. You know, I, I try to lead with all of that. And so I think when I have employees that I see that are 
um, you know, putting the effort and their attention to detail is really great. And I'm very encouraging when things are going right. And I, I, I can honestly be a hard product person to work for at times when things aren't going right. Um, or, but I'm always going to find the solution. I'm always going to help us find a solution so that doesn't happen again. Like I'm, I would say I'm a, um, I don't know. I, I don't want to say I have like a tough love. I have a tough side, but I also I'm I'm 90% of the time I'm very happy and enjoy enjoying what I'm doing and um leading with passion. And there's there's 10% of my job that is you kind of have to be a bad guy sometimes. Not a bad guy, but you have to you you have to be willing to make a tough decision. And sometimes that's not always a decision that's like people are gonna agree with, but you have to like believe in in my decisions and and like my quality of work kind of over a long period of time. I just trust my own judgment i guess to a degree and i know things should should always i guess I, i'm always trying to get things to a certain level or standard that i believe they should be at and that's universal for any project i work on but i don't know i think if people enjoy enjoy me it's probably because of the energy uh, or i try to be really creative and collaborative um, always try to be providing new ideas so i think when things are fresh all the time people like that um and again i'm always quick to give people props like if, if people have a good idea and i'm always willing t to give it a listen give it a try like that I, I try to be open communal um i like laughing i mean i i really i really like laughing a lot i i, I think the coolest people that i know are the people who make me laugh the most and um you know there's definitely times to be serious but i try not to be too serious um i definitely take my job serious and I'm I'm kind of a sicko at at my craft to a degree, you know. Like I'll, I'll produce a game, like an Aces game, and then I'll watch the game immediately after on like the Aces app. And and I'll. This sounds very familiar. This sounds like my. This sounds like my life. Yeah. So, yeah, and like, I love that. I love that you know, though. Like we film stuff immediate day, and I immediately want to like get into diving into the the content and seeing what we got and. I'm I'm just I I really do love what I do I guess and I I guess people see that and it resonates with them and I try to share that energy I try, I I'm a big culture guy again I try to bring in people that I feel like um, also want to be great <laughs> you know I like if there are people that are just coming in and just doing the job and they're kind of moping through the day those aren't the people that I'm gonna bring back you know necessarily right. like I'm looking for a certain enthusiasm yeah, type of person yeah like, you gotta want to like, be there exactly I, I want people that want more and um you know I, I like people that you know are looking for that next opportunity like you know 20 i always it's, it's it seems like a long time ago but it also feels very fresh to be like that that one like the little like the young you know kid in his career that was just dying for the next opportunity like begging for the next opportunity and as soon as i got one i would you know i always say if like uh if i was to have like an edge or whatever it was like to, it was seizing opportunities and then like literally spending like night and day obsessing over those opportunities to make sure that i was prepared you know like just making sure i was prepared and like um over preparation has never done me wrong you know like uh, over being over prepared for something has never gotten me in trouble under <laughs> under under preparing you might feel differently that's know? that's a great quote i love that man i love that all right i got one more thing for you all right for young people who look to you and admire you, maybe someday they want to direct, produce a uh, world championship sports team. What would you say to them? I have a lot to tell them, man. I have a lot to tell young people. Um, I I would say first off, just don't ever give up on yourself. That would be the first thing. Like I, you know, it's, life can be tough, man. Everybody goes through their shit. Everybody goes through their their moments, and you know, really wise people told me everybody experiences the same things in life. It just happens at different points in their lifetime. I've always kind of like thought, kept that in the back of my mind, like especially when I'm going through hard times. Like other people are going to experience this stuff, you know. Other people are going, you know, might have dark times or whatever. But just don't give up on yourself. Like always keep your pat, like leading with passion. I feel like if you're always leading and like following your passion, you might like I might I might not have ever become an NBA basketball player or basketball myself professionally, even though I tried. I you know I tried. I played semi pro basketball. Um, it wasn't for lack of trying. I definitely definitely put the effort into it, but I still followed my passions, and and those led me into you know professional sports opportunities in different realms I didn't even know existed. 
you know, I always, as a young kid, I always thought like, oh man, you know, you know to be involved in sports, it's, you really got to be involved in the team. You're either playing on the team or you're coaching or you're a scout, you're an agent. I never really thought about all of the magic that, you know, happens behind the scenes. And so I think once I got exposure to that, I was like, oh my God, there's so many opportunities. I, I When I first walked into the Seattle Sonics and Storm front office, there's 125 people walking around in an office, right? I'm just a young college kid. And I, and I knew that this was my interest. I knew that this was like, the second I got there, I was like, oh my God. Like this is my hive. Like this is this is where I this is where I belong. Like this is like even just the buzz in the in the office. They had like the in the in, even in the I remember in the uh, receptions area they had like you know sneakers from the court playing and stuff like just in the sounds while you're waiting in the reception area. <laughs> and I remember funny. just being like, this is my this is my hive. Like this is where I belong. I just don't know which department yet. And so like once I got my foot in the door, it was literally just like I'm I'm obsessed with, with this opportunity. I'm gonna, I'm just going to keep working at this until I can get another opportunity. And then once I got like the part-time job and then I got an internship and that got me into the front office and then I got to understand what the different departments were. And then I just made myself available to any, again, any and all opportunities. What I would tell young people is do exactly that. Follow your passion until you get an opportunity and keep following until you get the next opportunity. And even if you don't think the opportunity is perfect for you, Take it because there's lessons in it, you know? There's yeah. lessons in every opportunity. So some of my first opportunities, like the Sonics, was like a, after I after I did like a guest relations was my first job. So I would go to games. Uh, we would hand out stats uh, to the courtside people, take their jackets as they came in. We were just like information providers. Like we would go answer questions around the concourse and just, just help navigate fans' experience. That was what, what our, our role was. Once I got an internship for guest relations, I started doing work in the office, started understanding all the different departments, how they work together. Then I was like, I was really gravitated towards game presentation because what they seemed to be doing was really interesting and marketing because like I'm a creative guy. So like it just seemed like that's where all the creatives were. They had the graphic designers, they had the videographers, you know, they had the people coming up with this really fun, the fun ways to, to show off sports. And so I was like, I want to go do stuff over there. I finally got an opportunity to do some stuff with them on a small project, that's how I met Pat, my business partner. He was the youngest director in the NBA at the time. He had just kind of gotten his opportunity a really odd way. Two people above him had both kind of left. All of a sudden he's thrust into this really important role at 27 years of age. I didn't know that at the time. I was, bare, I mean, I'm, at the time I was you know, six years, eight years younger than him, just trying to find my way through it. But he was, you know, dealing with his own stuff like being this youngest you know game director and all that but anyway I, I had gotten an opportunity to do a thing for his his department and just kind of fell in love with it but i also made myself available to community relations i made myself available to sponsorship i made myself available to ticket sales i was doing ticket sales and like i'm not a sales guy right i'm not a sales guy but they, they had me do some like call a bunch of season ticket holders and tell them about a a change in the tip off time or something like that and so i i they gave me this list and it was like hundreds of people and I just assumed they wanted it done by the end of the day. So I did them all in one day, but they was like, they wanted it done by the end of the week. That, so they didn't <laughs> even tell me that though. I just did them all in one day. I just yeah. left messages. I called so many people, but I did it all in one day. And one of the sales guys was like, Hey, I heard you on the phone. You know, whatever, would you ever want to try a sales job? And I was like, never thought about it, but why not? You know? Yeah. And like, I, now I know from doing that and taking that opportunity that I would never want to do sales. Right. But I, I learned very valuable things, even to this day, how to talk to people on a phone, you know, how to navigate a conversation, those type of things, very valuable skills. But I don't like talking about credit card payments and stuff right. with people who don't necessarily have a bunch of money right. to spend on tickets and stuff. So like, I found out I didn't like the sales part, but I, you know, you learn something with it. And you know, I also learned like, okay, sales jobs aren't for me. I'm not gonna be looking for sales jobs in the future. Right. But I also then under had a great understanding of how the sales department worked. And how those people did their job, it just helped me do my job better and what, what they could benefit from the things I was doing in other, other departments. It, it is interesting because, it, it, you know, there, especially in industries where it is rare to be like the center, like at the center stage of, of, of the job position, like a, like a, let's say a, um, like a, like a, like a, you know, pop singer or something like that. Um, the music industry, sports, all that stuff, they, like there's very limited spots, but, but yeah, it, it's, we overlook, I think, when we're young and we don't realize there that these industries are full of oh, yeah. spaces for people to, that people can take up. You oh know? yeah, and get in somewhere. Like get in somewhere. You have to start somewhere. Yeah. Like I, I for, being adjacent is better than not yeah, being in. It I at started. All. I started with a, a minimum wage game night job. Again, handing out stats, and then through that was able to see other opportunities that I thought would be more interesting. Inquire about them. 
and just follow those opportunities to new opportunities that were more intriguing and slowly by doing that and never giving up the search you know what yeah. i mean like never give up the search that's why i mean just always follow your passion i'm still to this day you know 20 something years down my pro pro professional career still following my passions like i'm still doing the projects that i find and i'm able to do it in, in a much larger capacity which with a whole staff around me and you know i've created my own company it's something i didn't necessarily didn't dream of doing but it's that's where i'm at now and um it's because i'm leading with passion and everywhere i go i'm just bringing the energy that i think people are hiring me to bring you know um so i guess if i had to again paraphrase all of that for a young person it would be continue to follow your passion take every opportunity even if you don't think it's the right opportunity you're going to get valuable lessons out of it and you might be able to just cut off whole segments of like I don't want to do sales that takes out every sales department job out of my like you know what i'm looking for and then again i, I following my passions ended up i ended up as an entrepreneur and like i i always wanted to start it in my own business i didn't know it would happen so quickly yeah i didn't even think that when i was working for the seattle sonics and storm that was going to be something that would be something i would do much later in my life right and i didn't anticipate the sonics leaving i didn't anticipate a lot of that stuff happening but it's because i kept following the opportunities showing up bringing energy learning like i still to this day don't know everything you have to know that you're not gonna know everything don't right. show up and expect that you're the expert in the room everyone should listen to you like i learned stuff from young people i learned stuff from older people i learned stuff from people who are my age and different jobs and like you got you got to stay open-minded follow your passion it doesn't happen overnight i think that's something that's a huge misconception mm -hmm. Is that someone, someone's just going to give you this opportunity? Yeah. And, uh, I mean, honestly, unless I've only seen that when people like have owners of the team or something, and it's, here's their relatives or something get handed positions. But like, I've never, that's not reality. In it's most, good to realize in that cases. early too, because sometimes we realize that it a little later in life. It does not happen overnight. It yeah. does not happen overnight. You might be chasing this dream for a long time, yeah. but also just like enjoy the journey. I mean, like I've gotten to enjoy so many things, travel the world and do so many things that, I never would have even dreamt of or even thought was possible, but it's all because I've just, again, followed my passion um, and um, taken opportunities, whether they were comfortable ones or not. Uh, you learn you learn either way. Oh, I love that, brother. <laughs> That's great, man. Matt, thank you so much. Hey, for appreciate on. you having me, man. Seriously. Hell yeah, man. Well, we did it. <laughs>